Did you know that since 1950, the Pebble Beach Car Week, as we celebrated last week, the Concorde d'Elegance, brings more money in tourism and in <clears throat> donations to not-for-profits than any other event on this peninsula. Did you know also that everybody has a room 222, a personal nemesis <laughs> that freaks them out, and breaks them into a cold sweat, and um, for me, so for them it may be snakes or spiders, for me it's red cars. <laughs> and in spite of that personal nemesis, I applied and was hired to be a limo driver at the 2003 Concours de Elegance. The training was great. It was held in the Hyatt, not Pebble Beach itself, but they took us around in a van to all the sites where these parties by Bentley and Cadillac and, and Ford would be held. And Gary, the head trainer and master's assistant, told us the rules. First he gave us a walkie-talkie that looked to me the size of this clock, and it felt like a IBM computer and I was Mac <laughs> and I'm supposed to dial Gary, Gary. He said, communication is huge, huge. Call me anytime you have any questions or need anything. If you can remember 777789 on this thing that wasn't a cell phone. And then he said, never eat in the car at all. Never even drink water when you have a passenger there. Do whatever your passengers ask and by all means, drive safely and have fun. He asked Charles, a retired limo driver from Hollywood who had just moved up here, to get out and show us how to appropriately get in the car. And so when you're letting your passenger out, you walk around to the other side of the car, hold the door for them, and stand with your hands behind your back. And we also had to wear a uniform that I spent a hundred dollars in thrift stores to get, you know, a blue blazer, khakis, loafers, white shirts. Okay, so the next day after the training, on day number one, I had a little sweat. Okay, <laughs> I, Gary calls me in and I see a sea of white and black Lincoln Connell and hands me the key to one and he says, I've got the perfect assignment for you, it's Silvana Appendino. She is the assistant to Giorgia Benini, the president of, a, of Ferrari. All you have to do is take her wherever she wants to go all week long. You can take the car home at night. I said, great. I got in the car. This is 6.30 in the morning. I'm not to pick her up till 8 at the Hyatt to bring her to breakfast at the lodge. And uh, I put the key in the car, and the air conditioning was on. And I thought, good, I had my husband around the corner to help me. And I drove around the corner, and he showed me how to use this dashboard, which quite confused me. I have a 10-year-old Honda Civic. I'd never driven a Lincoln town car. <clears throat> and then as he's checking out the car, there's a little light on the screen that's pretty close to the rearview mirror that says, check engine oil now. Oh. And so I call Gary and tell him, he says, well, if she notices it, just tell her it's a computer glitch. I'm sure the car's fine. We <laughs> rented every Lincoln town car between here and Los Angeles. You'll be fine. So I meet Silvana, and she says, Oh, Patricia, bueno, hello, hello. I love you. And first we go to hairdresser, and she brings her boyfriend along, who really did need a haircut. And I take them back to Del Monte Center, being very careful with my driving, realizing <clears throat> This is not really the stress-free retirement job I dreamed. I'm driving a $70,000 car. I'm responsible for two people's lives in this car. What am I going to do? You know. So I move on that day pretty safely with just that little bit of sweat. On day number two, no sweat. I pick her up for breakfast in the morning about 9 o'clock, and she hands me a little button, and I go, <clears throat> That. And she said, this fell off my jacket and I have another one that doesn't match. Can you please go to a department store and try to match it? 
No problem. I was a home economics teacher. I know where the only fabric store in Pacific Grove is. I have lots of free time while she's in meetings, and I buy six buttons and one special button. And when she gets back in the car after lunch, she says, oh, I'm free right now. I'm going to take a nap, but would you take Carlos and I out to dinner somewhere? Wonderful. You pick. Just meet me at six. So I managed to go to Carmel and get a reservation in Cafe Napoli, the best Italian restaurant in Carmel. And ta I said, give me your jacket back and I'll sew the buttons on while you're gone, thinking service, thinking tip. Tips <laughs> were not included, said Gary in the training, because their contracts had tips included in them, but the other drivers, including Charles, who told me that he once left Charlton Heston in a wool shirt and a kilt at a gas station in the desert because he thought he was sleeping in the back of the car on the way to Las Vegas. So anyway, I got the jacket and I managed to drive around and drive on the roads as Gary told us in training. And I saw the Maserati tent, which is right next to the spa in Pebble Beach. And it's these two big, huge silver tents with big zippered openings and armed guards by the openings. And we, the help, who behind the, the Maserati tent was a parking lot where all the people were security guards and people hired from, you know, Oakland and Los Angeles to run food in these little golf carts everywhere. They fed us back there behind the Maserati tent. So I spent, I learned that limo driving has a lot more to do with limo waiting than that. <laughs> so day number two went by pretty well. I gave her the buttons on her new coat and she loved it. And day number three though, lots of sweat. I'm driving my limo and to pick her up at the Hyatt, and she says, Mr. Benini wants me to ride with him to the golf course Italiano, which was on Bayonet and Black Horse Golf Course. They transformed that into, and he was a judge, her boss, for the best Italian car. And I was to follow Charles, who was driving the Beninis and Silvana there. And I'm following her, but somehow other cars got in front of me, and I can't see Charles and nowhere to park. And I find myself driving on a green, it looks like, or a range, whatever that's called, and I find myself flipping back toward a sandbar. Like, ah. But I managed to get out, and then there was this silver wire, like a fence, in front of me, and I asked two tourists with a bag full of auto limo to please lift that wire, and I safely got to the other side. And, uh, waited for Miss Appendino to come back after the judge, and that was fine. Um, day four and five, oh, but then I had to wait for her outside the lodge for an evening party, and it was 10.30, it was 11 o'clock, and I made friends with Jason, the maitre d' of valet parkers in front of the lodge. He even let me park by the shops in the circle where there are fox stoles and $300 golf shirts and shoes that were $1,100 because I got to look around. But I turn the car on when she calls on her cell phone to get there and it makes this alarm and Jason comes over and stops the alarm and then it says, check engine now. <laughs> so I go, oh, what is going on? And so I call Gary, 789, and he said, oh, there are no replacement cars. What am I going to do? I said, look, I can drive safely, get her home to the Hyatt. I can get to your place. And basically, uh, he said, I have a replacement car. A Ford turned in their demo. It's a Mustang, convertible. I said, what color is it? I said, red. <laughs> There's more to this story, but in the interests of time, I will spare you the assignation that I took Mr. Farini too, up in Big Sur. And I will tell you that when I got my paycheck, they told me, oh, you were so good, they loved you, you must know the concept of service. And I said, yes, I do, because I got no tip. Oh. <laughs> Oh,
all the Toastmasters, esteemed guests, and especially Pat, it's a great privilege to evaluate the number five speech and the storytelling manual that Pat delivered to us. In the number five speech, you bring together all the things that you've learned and practiced through the previous four projects, and you apply them to bringing history to life. And your objective is exactly that, to use those skills and illustrate them by bringing some historical event or historical person to life. And Pat succeeded in doing that. She took on a very big challenge, in my opinion, because she talked about an event that she personally participated in. And while the Concourse d'Elegance was the, the event, the historical event, she was a simple character. Now, part of what you're supposed to do in this is develop characters. And she developed three characters extremely well. First, herself. We learned about <laughs> Pat and her relationship with this event and this job that she took on. We also learned about her boss, Gary, and about her client, Mrs. O. And I think those character developments were all perfectly <laughs> adequate for the story. An area for improvement, you might have emphasize more some of the, the characteristics of your client or your boss. Um, but there were things that I especially loved about this uh, particular story. And they revolve around Pat's command of storytelling, especially her attention to the details and bringing out the details and making them vivid. You know, when she talks about her walkie-talkie being <laughs> the size of this clock, you know, she brings it home to us, and she talks about you know, her relationship with her limousine, <laughs> which was flawed from the very beginning, and other sorts of things. You know, the detail and the description are, are really well done. There, there are some areas where I think Pat could improve, and of course the biggest one has to do with time. And you have to just mercilessly cut out every part of the story and every detail <laughs> That, that, uh, that isn't part of the main plot point. And of course, in the end I realized, as she had to rush her climax, that the main plot was, was, was really about what she did and didn't get out of this. And she got out of this and, and wonderful story and experiences to tell. But she didn't get the tips or <laughs> enumeration that she expected. And I think she could have played that up a little more with a little more time at the end and, and made it what was a really great story, even better. If you had this to do again, I am certain that you could winnow it down to that nine minutes and make it a <coughs> tight, compelling, complete story because you're an actual storyteller, you're a skilled storyteller, as we all know from having witnessed the many speeches that you've given here. And I look forward to you taking on another manual. But I urge everyone to take on the storytelling manual because it's wonderful. Thank you.